Father, we come to you tonight. We just thank you once again to just allow us to just have the opportunity to come and worship you. Allow us to continue in our study here in Zephaniah. And Father, we thank you for the many things that you do in our lives. Just be with each and every one. Just comfort each one. Put your healing touch on those that need your healing touch. Just bless each and every one that was here tonight. And be with those that are not able to be here. And Father, we just ask your continued prayers for this nation, the people that might turn to you, and just uh, pray for a revival. And Father, we just ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Tonight, we're going to continue in Zephaniah study, and this will be Zephaniah part four. And we're going to pick it up where we left off last week, or before, the Zephaniah chapter 1, verse 16. So Zephaniah chapter 1, verse 16. So if you turn there, please. All right, so Zephaniah chapter 1, verse 16. A day of the trumpet and alarm against the fenced cities and against the high towers. The trumpet of battle will be sounded against even the fenced cities and the high towers that were used for lookouts. These places thought they were secure, but even they will not escape the wrath of God on the day of the Lord. You know, the, in, in verse 15, you know, we had read about, you know, the day of wrath and the day of trouble and all that that was coming. And, you know, I mentioned, you know, how the different verses was talking about how they would get up on the hills and all these people thought they were safe. Well, that's what's talked about here. You know, now they says the day of the trumpet and alarm against the fenced cities and against the high towers. So it doesn't matter, you know, how, matter where these people thought they were, you know, they're secured up in a high tower, they're secure, you know, in a fenced city or something. When God says you're going to be destroyed, you're going to be destroyed. You cannot stop it. You cannot hide from it or anything else. You know, all, all these people up in these high towers, they were just going to actually see the Babylonians and so forth coming in. You know, so they would actually see the enemy coming. It's kind of like, you know, when Russia going into Ukraine, then... You know, I'm sure that there was people, or if they were smart, they would have been watching for these Russians coming in. But, you know, I'm sure they had people observing, and you could see them coming. But there's not much you can do about it. You know, they're coming. Well, it's the same thing here. When God comes, and we, or, you know, in this case, he used the Babylonians to come and do his work for him. If God, if God um, says that's what is going to happen, that's what's going to happen. You know, and you're not going to defeat them. Well, let's take a look at verse 17 of Zephaniah chapter 1. And I will bring distress upon men that they shall walk like blind men because they have sinned against the Lord and their blood shall be poured out as dust and their flesh as the dung. Now the people will become so distressed from seeing the Babylonian army as well as the destruction that they will walk around like blind men. They will be so distressed that they will not be able to think and be walking around in the days as if they were blind. You know, that's that happens to a lot of people. You know, they just can't handle stress at all. And they just start walking around like, you know, they're all just totally out of their minds or whatever. That's, that's what God was saying was going to happen to the Israelites, to the people of Judah, when they saw the Babylonians coming. Because you know, they were such a shock that they couldn't believe it. You know, they're God's chosen people that... God would never allow this to happen. You know, even though his prophets were prophesizing it, they just still could not believe it. Even when, you know, when they saw it actually happen, they just, I can't believe this. This is happening. But they will also walk as spiritually blind men as they will still refuse to turn to God even when they see the prophecy of death and I being fulfilled. And the same thing will happen during the tribulation as the people continue in rebellion against God and walk around blindly to their coming destruction. Remember I told you that many of these verses now I apply to what happened there when the Babylonians came in and they took them captive, but also to what's going to happen come, come about in the future, you know, great tribulation. And a lot of these verses for the, for the people of Judah applies to both of them, you know, Israel as a whole. But, you know, the people, they just, it, it's the same thing. It's going to happen now and then, but it's going to happen during the Great Tribulation. 
You know, they see all the things that are going on and they still are blind to see they need to choose God. And, you know, I mean, at that point, like I said, there's no more, you don't have your atheist. I mean, everybody knows there's a God and they know there's a Satan. It's just a matter of which side you're going to pick. You know, there's no more hiding it anymore. Like I said, you don't have people with their atheists or you don't have, you know, it's just what side are you going to serve? Or which God are you going to serve? The living God or the God of this world, Satan? You know, the false God of darkness. But this verse also refers to the fact that for those who are not walking with God, and especially for the unsaved, they have been blinded by Satan. And this is what happened to the people at the time of the Babylonian invasion, as well as will happen also during the tribulation. You know, it's like I just said, it's not even just the people of Israel, but just people in general. You know, even nowadays, there's so many people that are so blinded by Satan that they just cannot spiritually have their eyes open to see anything. I mean, even if, even if there's not a, not a Christian, there are things that you should still be able to physically be able to have the spiritual knowledge to see stuff. That, but you know, but when you got when someone's a Christian and they're still that spiritually blind to not see what's going on in some of this stuff, you know, it, it's just if, if they can't, if there's you can't see it, there's no hope for the unsaved, you know, because they don't have the Holy Ghost guy in them. But I mean, it's just a shame that when Christians, you know, are spiritually blind to seeing, you know, things that are going on. And trust me, during the Great Tribulation, it's going to be far, far worse than what it is now. Well, let's turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 4. Galatians. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 4. You were close. 4 4. You will be real good next week. Four. Chapter four, verse four. Four four. For what? Okay, so Second Corinthians chapter four and verse four. In whom the God of this world have blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God should shine unto them. And of course, if you read the scripture, we know that the God of this world is referring to Satan himself. You know, right now, Satan had, this world has been given to Satan after the fall of Adam. Then when he, he sinned, he gave up, this was his world. He was in control of it. He lost control of that, and now it's Satan's world until Jesus comes back and takes it during the millennium. But right now, Satan is the God of this world. He has blinded the minds of them which, which believe not. You know, it, it, he, he can disrupt the blinds, the minds of people that are saved, but they can't totally blind us. But like I said, there's still enough of them that are spiritually blind enough because Satan, you know, these Christians have allowed Satan to even blind some of them so that even they're blind to some of the, the stuff that's going on. But, you know, what this referred to directly is that they're blind from the gospel. You know, they, they, you know, you can give them the gospel, but Satan has blinded them, and they just don't want to have their eyes open. And it's what's going to happen with the tribulation. I mean, there's so many people. Yes, there'll be people who get saved, but the vast majority of them are never going to get saved, whether they're Jew or Gentile, because they're just blinded by Satan. And even with all, like I said, when at that point there's no dispute that there's a, a true God, they're still blinded and still decide to choose Satan. You know, they take that mark of the beast and. And, um, you know, that's what Satan does. Is he, he controls people. And that's why, you know, even as Christians, we need to stay in the Word of God each and every day, pray, so forth, stay strong, so that Satan can't influence us and we're not blinded by what's going on in the world. But we see the people become like blind men because they have sinned against the Lord. Now, Zephaniah warns that their blood shall be poured out like dust, meaning there will be so much blood, it will be similar to how dust is so common. You know, you go to like to the beach or just anywhere, like a, somebody don't maintain their house, or just anywhere, there's a lot of dust. You work in a factory, some certain factories where, you know, sawmill or whatever, you know, something like that, and there's something that's got a lot of dust. Things that, that, it, it's just so common, and that's, there's going to be so much blood that that's what, you know, basically compared it to that dust, and it's, it's just, that's how much blood there's going to be. You know, this this will also happen 
during the Battle of Armageddon, of course, on an even greater scale, as the blood will be as high as the horse's bridle for a distance of about 200 miles, or as the King James Bible says, 1,600 furlongs, which a furlong, you know, it, it computes out to be 200 miles. You know, that furlong is actually a, uh, a measurement that, anyway, like I said, that's equal to 200 miles. I don't know the exact length of what it is anymore, but it's from, far. What? It's far. Yeah, it's fur. <laughs> <laughs> Probably your memories of the Missouri is a fur. <laughs> from, but anyway, the, during the uh, Great Tribulations, like I said, the blood, during the Battle of Armageddon, the blood would be as high as horses' bridles for a distance about 200 miles or 1,600 furlongs. From all of those who have been killed. You know, there's going to be so many people that get killed. Millions and millions and millions of people that are going to get slaughtered. That the blood's going to be that deep. You know, everybody down here, you know, we have enough horses around here in the state. That, um, you know, you know that's that's a lot of blood. So, some of you city folks have maybe never seen a horse. Then, you know, but that's a lot of blood. If it's a, as tall as a horse that... My daughter just in kind of just not making tea. Oh yeah, Clydesdales or something like that, you know. And then say what kind of horse. It's thoroughbred. Yeah. Yeah, they're they're tall. They're big horses. But even even at a even at a smaller horse, that's a lot of blood. But if you would turn to Revelation chapter 14, verse 20, and we'll take a look at this inscription. So Revelation chapter 14 and verse 20. Yeah, Missouri's got more horses than uh, per capita than any other state. So, like I said, we know really? we know our horses. I thought Kentucky might. No, nah, I think they might be second. They just have the Kentucky Derby. For, they have the race horses. They got we, it. we have the other horses. So, Revelation chapter fourteen and verse twenty. And the winepress was trodden without the city, and blood came out of the winepress, even unto the horses' bridles, by the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs. And again, for like I said, people may not know much about horses, you know, the bridle's the part that goes in the mouth, you know, so it's, you're talking, you know, they're standing up. That's a, that's a lot of blood. But Zephaniah also warned the flesh of the people would be as dung. Now, not only was dung fairly common from the horses that were around, but the reference shows the people's flesh would just pile up on the ground and be worthless as dung. It would also stink the way dung does. Now, for you who don't know what dung is, that's like animal waste. You know, that's, that's poop. They're excrement. They're poop. Yes. Manure. You know, excrement. <laughs> manure. There you go. That's the word. Manure. Uh, but that that would um, you know it, it was showing that comparison there that their flesh was going to be as dung that you know it's it's basically just as work, worthless for the most part as you know yes you can use it as fertilizer or whatever but Word feels that it, it's um, you know I mean remember Paul said you know for him, you know, all things to him were as dung you know in other words they're just worthless you know yeah you can have all these material things but we can't take them with us to heaven. And that's what Paul was saying that, you know, they're just ultimately they're worthless. Yeah, they're nice to have some of these things, but they're they're ultimately they're they're no more worth anything than a pile of dung. That you know, and, and that's what these people are. These people would be getting slaughtered by the, the Babylonians. You know, you see some of this stuff going on in Ukraine even right now, some of the stuff happened like during World War II or whatever, where there'd be so many people being killed and stuff, and they just start piling the bodies up and just walk over them, leave them, do whatever, and so forth. And, you know, they were basically just as like, they were worthless. They were dead, so they didn't care about them. You know, a lot of people, they don't treat their, their dead with respect the way, you know, Americans normally do. And so, you know, you see you see this type of, um, you know, the comparison here, what was going to, you know, what Zephaniah was prophesizing was going to happen. Well, let's take a look at uh, verse 18 now. So Zephaniah chapter 1 and verse 18. Neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them in the day of the Lord's wrath. But the whole land shall be devoured by the fire of his jealousy. 
for he shall make even a speedy riddance of all them that dwell in the land. So verse 18 shows that no amount of money will be able to deliver them from the Lord's wrath on that day. You know, the same applies today and during the tribulation as the super rich will suffer from God's judgment just as much as the poorest unsaved person. You know, initially during the Great Tribulation, when it first starts, initially the rich are going to get richer, just like what's happening today, and the poor get poorer. Remember it says, you know, don't touch their, their oil and wine. But yet the poor didn't have anything, they couldn't even find anything to eat, they were starving, yet the rich still had all their oil and wine. Well, that's basically what's happening even in our nation, you see that now, where, you know, you got these people that are worth, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars, literally, you know, Elon Musk, I think it's like 300 billion last count, probably more than that now. And he's already predicting that he just invested some stock for this artificial intelligence, you know, that they want to make of and everything, which is going to be coming about probably during the tribulation. And he already said, somebody will be the first trillionaire off of that stock. So, whether it's true or not, but I wouldn't surprise me. I, I, I really wouldn't shock me at all if, if we had a trillionaire within not too many years from now. But, and then you see, so you got these people, they're the extreme felt, uh, wealthy, rich people. I, I mean, I, I remember when I was young, there was originally only five billionaires in the whole world, and they were all American men. You know, you had the Gettys, and I don't remember who all the, whatever. But anyway, the Rockefellers and stuff, whatever. And now, I think just in the United States alone, there's like 550 billionaires or something like that. And then worldwide, there's a whole bunch more and all that stuff. So, you know, you see how vast. And, and the thing is, it's not even just, oh, you're a billionaire anymore. I mean, a billionaire is like, now you got multi-billionaire. You know, and I mean, even a millionaire used to be a big deal. If you're a millionaire, now you're just, oh, you're only worth a million. I mean, it, it, it doesn't. It's like you're poor, you're only worth a million, you know. So it, it, um, you know, you see the, the extremes happening. It's not as vast yet here in the United States, but it's still, you know, they call them that one percent, you know, that they have all the money or whatever. But it's, uh, you know, you see where people are struggling to eat, and then you have others that have they couldn't have literally spent enough money in their lifetime to ever go broke. So you know, you see the, these extremes. You know, you see like where some of these uh, Russians. Uh, oligarchs, where they even have some of their yachts confiscated. You know, some of these yachts were worth between five hundred and seven hundred fifty million dollars. You know, they're literally like miniature naval ships and stuff. I mean, they have crews of you know 20, 30 people and all this stuff. I mean, if you ever looked at some of the pictures of, of some of them, they had one that was docked in New York City, and I've seen some pictures of it and stuff like that. And um, you know, this thing, it was worth, like I said, like $750 million. And, and And this guy had multiple yachts, plus airplanes. So, I mean, it wasn't like he just had one yacht, $750 million. I mean, he had multiple yachts, multiple airplanes. I mean, so you see how filthy rich some of these people in the world are. That There's that extreme, but no matter how rich you are, ultimately, especially when the Great Tribulation comes, God's wrath is going to come upon everybody. That it doesn't matter... Your money will not save you from his wrath. It will not save you from hell. You know, it, it, it um, you know, even then at that point, even the super rich are going to start losing some of their money. That, that uh, when the Antichrist starts taking over his power, you know, even some of those super rich that are kind of running the world now, they're going to find out that, you know, like I said, that money's not going to, not going to stop them from, uh, you know, getting that wrath of God. So, like I said, even the poorest person, you know, I, I mean, that, you know, God is not, it says he's not a respecter of persons. It doesn't matter if you're rich, you're poor, you're white, you're black, you know, it doesn't matter what you are, if you're male, female, you know, if you're, it says, you know, if you're in bond or if you're free, whatever. So, you know, it doesn't matter. God is not a respecter of people. You know, when his wrath comes, it's going to come upon everybody. You know, all those people, you know, if they've rejected Jesus as their Savior. But as I said, no amount of money will save a person as they cannot buy their way out of receiving the wrath. No bribes will be accepted. You, know, you can't say, hey, God, I'll, I'll give you $100 billion if you leave me alone. No, because God already owns all of your money plus everybody else's money. He's just got to have, has loaned it out to you to let you use it. 
but it's his money. He owns the whole world. You know, the, it sucks about, you know, it says it has all the cattle and all the hills. And he owns the hills too and stuff, you know? So, you know, you're, you're not going to be able to bribe God despite what some of these people think. Silver and gold will be nothing when you are suffering the wrath of God. You know, even now, they always talk about, you know, people need to go out and collect some gold and store all this stuff. And I'm not saying that you should be wise and try to put a little money aside and, and, and try to do these things. But ultimately, you know, no matter what happens, I mean, if, when you're starving to death, I mean, you could have 15 bars of gold sitting right here. But if nobody will give you any food for that... That gold is worthless. You're going to still starve to death and die, even though you have a ton of money there. That it's not going to do you a thing if you don't, you know, you can't use it for what's needed, such as food or, or, or things like that. You know, like I said, when you start getting that wrath of God, your money's not going to matter. You're not going to be thinking about, oh, I got these billions in the bank. What kind of investments can I make? You're just going to be trying to like, you know, remember these people would be hiding in the caves and it talks about them, you know, hiding in the caves and, and just wanting to die. And God won't even let them die. They try to commit suicide and they, you know, it's like that movie, uh, Groundhog Day or whatever. And, and they, they could jump off a bridge and they're going to wake up and not die. And then they can try something else and God just won't let them die. You know, they, they, it's just when you're not going to be, you can't escape that wrath of God. Now, security only comes when one places their trust in Jesus. You know, too many people, as I said, are putting it in their, their wealth, their money, their belongings. But that, that will do nothing for you. It'll all burn up ultimately at the end of time. And, uh, you know, unless you place your trust in Jesus, that's the only security you can have. You know, again, many believers will die during the tribulation, but their eternal souls are secure. There's Their souls... At, and we'll go to heaven. You know, they're, they're secure. You know, he's not talking about your physical security. You know, people come in here right now and shoot every one of us or whatever. You know, Jesus never said that he would protect our physical bodies. It's our spiritual bodies, you know, our spirit and our soul, if you're a true believer, that he has protected. That's what he has put into, you know, the, Jesus and God's hands. And, you know, Satan cannot take you, pull you out of that. You know, Jesus said that he never lost anybody except for the, the, the man of perdition, you know, the son of perdition, which we know was Judas Iscariot. But, you know, that was all part of, of uh, fulfilling pr prophecy. You know, Jesus didn't ever lose him because, you know, Judas was never a saved individual in the first place. He might have followed Jesus and everybody thought he was saved, but G Judas... Scared out was never a true believer. And that's the difference. He didn't lose his salvation. He never had the salvation to begin with. You know, and that's the key. Because he committed suicide. Yeah, but like I said, suicide it has nothing. You know, people always say you commit suicide, you go to hell. That has nothing to do with it. You, you go to hell because you reject Jesus as your Savior, not because you committed suicide. If you're a true Christian and you commit suicide... You're still going to go to heaven. Now, God is going to punish you for that. You're going to lose some reward because it's still a sin. Suicide is nothing more than killing yourself. And it says, thou shalt not kill. So, you know, you have committed murder on yourself. So, you know, you will lose some rewards to be punished, but you're not going to lose your salvation. You know, so, you know, that's not why Judas went to hell. Wasn't He didn't go to hell because he committed suicide. He went to hell because he rejected Jesus as his Savior. And here's a man that walked with Jesus for three and a half years. That's why I say, you know, it's kind of been the same thing during the tribulation. People see all this stuff, and it's still, they don't, um, it, 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 they just reject it. I mean, I mean, they just outright reject it. I mean, at that point, like I said, there's no disputing. And that just shows how hardened people's hearts are for the most part. That they, you know, even when people are walking with Jesus, or, you know, during the millennium. It's a good example, too. Jesus will be walking here again for a thousand years. And at the end, it says, you know, it's the sand of the sea, the number rebel against Jesus. So, you know, even when Jesus is physically around, they, they just, that's what's going to happen. But no part, excuse me, no part of Judah will escape his wrath. And the same will apply during the tribulation as the judgments from God will apply to all on the earth, no matter where they are. 
Remember I told you the Great Tribulation is going to be, really it's meant for the, the Jewish people, the Israelites. Both the, the tribes of, you know, from the nation of Israel and from the uh, nation of Judah. And they're all 12 tribes. But it also is going to affect the Gentiles. You know, it might be to try to get bring the, the Jewish people to the Lord and see that Jesus is the Messiah. But the Gentiles are going to be affected just as much. I mean, it's not as though, oh, well, I'm, I'm not a Jew, so I'm saved. No, that's not how it's going to happen. So, you know, it's going to affect, no matter where, the Jewish people, they can run to another nation, they can leave Israel, they can go wherever. It's still going to affect them. They, you know, they can't hide from it. That no matter where a person is, you know, it's going, to, it's going to apply to the whole earth. Not even in Antarctica will someone be saved. You know, you say, oh, I'll go down to Antarctica. There's nothing going to happen down there. No, you're not going to escape God's wrath even down in Antarctica. You know, God said he would make a speedy riddance of them, and he will do the same in the tribulation. So, like I said, again, a lot of these verses apply to both their dual means. They apply to both the time Babylonians as well as the Jewish people during the tribulation. And if you're still in uh, Revelation, look at Revelation chapter 19, verse 21. So turn back uh, one chapter. Revelation chapter 19, verse 21. I guess I should have told you to hold your finger there. Revelation chapter 19 and verse 21. And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which swords proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. And of course, the person on that horse they're referring to is Jesus himself. You know, he, the sword is his, is his word. He just speaks it and it happens. You know, it's not like he's got this physical sword. It's, it's you know, it's his, the sword is his word. That's how powerful his word is. And there's going to be all these people killed from all his wrath. That, you know, he calls in the fowls of the air to tell them to feast upon the bodies and the horses and so forth. You know, and it's, and it's that's what he even says. It says, even the horses of, you know, the leaders. You know, again, it doesn't matter if someone's a king or whatever. They're going to die and the horse will die just with them. And their flesh will be eaten the same as somebody that was just a little pauper or something. But God will bring his wrath Fast that there would not be anyone to escape it, even if you had more time. As I said, basically God's going to speak the word and it's done. You know, God will be swift to punish sin at this time with no more delays. God will give pe people time to repent. But when the time is up, judgment and wrath are swift. This applies in all cases of God's wrath. You know, it's just like the same thing. God gives you time, for the most part, to repent and call upon Jesus as your Savior. But it is a limited time off. Eventually, we're all going to die. Now, you might live to be 100. Somebody else might only live to be 20 or 50 or 30. But, you know, whatever time you have, it's a limited time off. God will give you time, for the most part, to repent. But it's not an endless offer. It is a limited time offer. And when that time's up, it's up. And then his wrath's coming. You know, and in this case, it's the same thing with the tribulation. He had said it's going to last seven years. You had seven years. When that time gets near that seven years, you better have repented and be calling on Jesus. Or when that seven years is up, that time's up. And then his wrath has come. And there's no more. You know, and it's going to be that quick. Like I said, he'll basically speak the word. And these people will die. Their souls will be taken to hell by angels, holy angels, and, uh, you know, they're done. I mean, there's, there's no more dispute and so forth at that time. But Zephaniah chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. Let's go ahead and start chapter 2 here. So Zephaniah chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. Gather yourself together, yea, Gather together, O nation not desired. Before the decree, bring forth. Before the day, pay it pass as the chaff. Before the fierce anger of the Lord come upon you. Before the day of the Lord's anger come upon you. Seek ye the Lord, all ye meek of the earth, which have wrought his judgment. Seek righteousness, 
seek madness, it may be ye shall be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. So Zephaniah calls for the nation of Judah to repent and gather themselves to God. Zephaniah says the people need to do this before, quote, the day of the Lord's anger come upon them. Like I said, there's going to be that day when God's anger comes. Well, you don't want that anger coming upon you. You know, Scripture says that, you know, you don't want the wrath of God upon you. Now, verse 2 says God will have fierce anger. God will not tolerate sin. And that's all sin. You know, there's not these little white lies people always say, you know, a, 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 a white lie is just as much a lie as anything else. And because now you start telling the truth doesn't unmake a lie or whatever. You're like Once you've told a lie, you can never undo having said a lie. Now, you can try to correct so that people know, okay, yes, I lied. But my point is that once you sin, yes, you can ask for forgiveness, but you can never take that. You can't go, oops, my bad. You know, I'll take it back. You know, once you sin, you have always sinned. Yes, you can ask for repent, you know, repent of it and ask for God for, to forgive you, and he will if you're sincere. But that still never changes you've always had that sin in, in, in you. So that, you know, Jesus doesn't necessarily see that sin, but when you get to heaven, then... You know, you're going to lose some rewards and so forth. You know, that you know, you're still ultimately, even though you've been forgiven and God has forgotten about it as far as the east is from the west, you're still ultimately, whatever sins we have, we're going to lose some of that closeness. So like, you know, we're not going to be as close to God as we would have been without that sin and so forth. You're going to lose some rewards that you might have had. Things. So, yes, you are forgiven, but you can't take back a sin once you've committed it. You know, God, as I said, he will not tolerate any sin, even so-called little sins. You know, because in God's eyes, you know, unlike the Roman Catholic Church, which has, you know, the, the mortal sins and venial sins that we talked about, God doesn't say that. There's sin and there's sin. You know, all sin is mortal in God's eyes. So that, you know, God doesn't look at it as like, well, that's a little sin and that was a big sin. Oh, you went out and murdered somebody, but you just did uh, some little little thing or whatever. You, you just stole a piece of candy or whatever. So, you know, God doesn't say, okay, well, I'm not going to punish you because your sin was minor compared to this one over here. You know, in God's eyes, sin is all evil and must be, be dealt with. You know, you could have lived a perfect life except for you did one little tiny sin. You, uh, Whatever, had, had some real bad thought, a bad thought, or just whatever. You know, like I said, you took that piece of candy or something. You know, and in most people's eyes, that's no big deal. I mean, that's, that's the only thing you ever did in your life. You never, ever had any other sins. It wouldn't matter. You would still go to hell unless you asked, you know, if you hadn't asked Jesus as your Savior. Because you have to be perfect in order to be able to get into heaven. And that's what the whole point of the blood of Jesus was. was so that he cleansed us because we cannot be perfect. That's what the law was to show us that we cannot be perfect. And then, and then it, so Jesus' blood washed away our sins so that we look as though we are perfect in God's eyes so then we can enter into heaven. But Zephaniah warned the people not to delay their repentance. Unfortunately, the people did not repent and listen to Zephaniah. You know, again, it was the same thing with them. Zephaniah, remember I told you, it was roughly like, 40 or 50 years from when the time they started before the Babylonians came in. I think it was 50 or something like that. And, you know, it's kind of the same thing. Just like the tribulation of seven years. It's a limited time offer. You had all these years to repent. Well, you used those years up. Now God's wrath is coming. The Babylonians were coming in. And they were, you were not going not gonna to change it. You know, as I said, God's wrath always has a time period, you know, that you know, he'll give you a certain amount of time to repent. And then after that, when the time's up, the time's up. You know, unfortunately, the people did not listen to Zephaniah. They didn't listen to pretty much any of God's prophets. That was always the problem. They weren't listening to God's prophets. And many people, many people believe they have all the time in the world to get right with God. They will always do it tomorrow or what 
excuse me, or when they have time. People in a nation cannot repent unless they turn in sincerity and want to get right with God. People are never guaranteed they have a tomorrow, so everyone needs to get right with God now. You know, we don't have any guarantees that when we leave here tonight, that we'll all get home safely. I pray that we do. But, you know, or anything could happen. You could uh, die in your sleep tonight or, you know, have a heart attack or anything can happen. You know, there's no guarantee that any of us has a tomorrow. And it has nothing to do with age. Like I said, you could be a 15-year-old child and still there's no guarantee you have a tomorrow. But people... Um, as I said, you know, do not put it off. Our nation today is in the same place that Judah was as our leaders have turned their backs on God as has most of the people here in America. People do not even think they need to get right with God and the same was with the people of Judah in Zephaniah's day. You know, repentance cannot come if no one wants it. You know, if you can't even recognize, you know, it's like somebody that's on drugs or, or something or Whatever. If they don't recognize they have a drug problem, they can't get off the drugs. Or if you know, same thing with the sin problem. If they don't recognize they have a sin problem, they can't fix the sin problem because in their eyes they don't even have a sin problem. You know, you can't fix something that you can't even realize that you have that problem. It doesn't matter what it is. If you think, well, I'm not addicted to this, well, I don't need to stop. You're not going to stop. Well, it's the same thing with the sin. If you don't recognize that you have a sin problem and you need Jesus as your Savior, you're not going to repent and fix that problem. And that's basically what's happening in our nation, just like happened with, with Judah at that time, that most of our leaders and the people don't even realize that they have a sin problem, that they need to be saved. And so, you know, you're not going to have repentance when people don't want it, number one, and don't say, say that they even need the problem, you know, have, have the problem. So, you know, that's something we need to be praying about is that, you know, repentance will come to the people. But the word, quote, before is used four times in verse 2 as a way once again to plead that you repent before it is too late. You know, let's take a look at that quickly here. Verse 2 again. Before, number one, the decree bring forth. Before the day pass as the chaff. Before the fierce anger of the Lord come upon you. Before the day of the Lord's anger come upon you. So four times, you know, I look at that. It says the fierce anger of the Lord come upon you. And then it says the Lord's anger come upon you. So twice it tells you the Lord's anger come upon you. But four times he's trying to tell you in verse 2. That he, you know, pleading that, you know, Zephaniah is pleading that Judah repent before it's too late. And then in verse 3. Zephaniah tells the people to seek the Lord as they have brought on the judgment of God. Now, nations of people do not want to bring on the judgment of God. There is no escape from it, as I said earlier. Zephaniah warns the people to seek righteousness and to be meek, or to humble themselves before God. And Zephaniah said that God might hide those who seek him when his wrath comes upon Judah. So, you know, it's just like during the tribulation when many of the Jewish people, I mean, initially, actually, the whole nation of, of Judah, even though they haven't turned to God yet, he, he protects them in Petra and other places supernaturally because he knows that they're going to ultimately turn to Jesus at the end of the tribulation. But the Jews outside of that and before that, you know, many of them, you know, two-thirds of the Jews will be slaughtered by the Antichrist. And it's the same thing here that Zephaniah was warning that if the people would turn to God and seek repentance, some of those would be, would be you know, God would protect. Look at what happened with, uh, you know, Daniel and his friends, some of the others. You know, he never said that he would keep them there in Judah. He never said that they were not still going to get taken captive. He just said, if you obey my word... I will protect you. And that was the same thing. Even the people that weren't necessarily saved, like, like Daniel and his friends, three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, then he still protected them and that many of those people still survived that full 70 years because they were obeying 
you know, what was being said. Or they, they were allowed to at least go to captivity. They may not live there whole 70 years just because due to their age when they went there. But, you know, God said, if you obey my word, just let them take you captive. He would keep them alive. So that was what, you know, what he did. And then uh, a couple other things quickly here. It says, before the day passes the chap. Now, for the, most of us probably know what that is, especially around here in farm country and stuff. But, you know, chaff, that's like on your wheat. That's the that's the, the stuff that gets discarded. It's the the the, 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 yeah, the, the, the part that's no good. That when you take and you um, harvest the wheat, that's you get the the wheat part, the husk. Or, yeah, basically like your husk and all that stuff. The stuff you would throw in the wind, it would just blow away. You know, that it's it's just like that. It's like the chaff. And just as like a wheat harvest is eventually passes away, it blows away. You know, that was what was going to happen with this day. And uh, of course, the meek it says, you know, seek ye the Lord in verse 3, all ye the meek of the earth. Well, Jesus talked about that in his Sermon on the Mount. You know, the meek, that's your humble. That's the ones that, that don't put their, let their pride keep them from getting saved. You know, that, that applies to all of us. There's so many people that are so proud, you know, more trying to send more people to hell than probably anything. You know, it's not necessarily just obedience or anything like that. I mean, obviously it's the rejection of Jesus as their Savior, but they have rejected Jesus as their Savior because of the pride. Their pride won't let them seek Jesus because my family or my friends are going to mock me and make fun of me. You know, I'm going to get picked on by the kids at school or children at school or, you know, whatever it may be. That it's always their pride or their pride. And I'm the president of the United States of America, so oh, I don't need Jesus. Or the, the pride that I'm the richest man in the world or, you know, whatever it may be. That, you know, it's, it's people's pride. And Jesus said we are to be humble or meek. As it says here, you know, and, that, and that's what he was, what he wants. That's the kind of people Jesus wants to seek after him, is the meek of the earth. You know, the, the, as I said before, the super rich, as you know, there are exceptions, but the, for the most part, the super rich do not get saved. Now, it's not that they cannot get saved; it's that they put their trust in riches, as it says in Matthew. And you know, that's the difference. If they would put their trust in Jesus. They can get saved just like anybody else. You know, there's nothing that says that a rich man can't get saved. You know, Abraham was a rich man. Job was a rich man. And they were saved individuals. You know, it's just that most people that are super rich, they put that trust in their riches rather than in Jesus. And that, and that's what, you know, a lot of these people were doing at this time. They were not necessarily putting their, their trust in riches, but they were putting their trust in in the wrong thing. They were putting their trust in the fact that they were the chosen people of God, that they didn't need repentance of salvation because they were the cho God's chosen people. So in their minds, they were they were automatically going to heaven. Well, that's not how it works. The Jewish people need to be saved the same as the Gentiles. They must repent and call upon Jesus as the personal Lord and Savior. They must admit that they are a sinner, just like everybody else. You know, they don't get a free ride just because they were born of Jewish blood, you know, just because they're God's chosen people. But we're going to stop there, and we'll pick this up next week. We'll pick it up in chapter 2, verse 4. But we'll have a word of prayer, and then we'll be dismissed. Father, we thank you once again for this time here. You've given us here tonight for this midweek service. We do pray, Lord, that you bless the rest of the week. Pray that you give each and every one here safety as they leave here tonight. Pray that they get home safely, safety for the week. Pray for a safe return on Sunday morning. And Father, we do thank you for Son Jesus that we do have the opportunity that whether you're rich or poor, white or black, what country you are born in, it doesn't matter whether you're... Uh, bond or free or it, it doesn't matter no matter what it is we can all call upon Jesus to be saved we all are saved in the same manner and that no one gets a free ride and no one gets a easier way to get there because you've already made it easy for us Lord all we have to do is admit that we are a sinner and that we we're in need of a savior and to repent of our sins and call upon Jesus to save us and that's, that's as simple as that. It's so easy that even a child can do it. In fact, you even said to come 
with a mind like a child. And Father, we do thank you for the easy gospel that you've given us, that, that we can have that easy salvation. But we know it was not easy for the Lord Jesus Christ, what he did for us. As we get ready to soon have Easter and celebrate the death of Jesus on the cross, and then we have the glorious resurrection day of Jesus' death, uh, triumph over death. And Father, we do thank you for that. And Father, we just, again, thank you for each and every one that was here tonight. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.